the Lord's Supper through the mind of God. Pliny the Younger wrote this. He was uh, governor of Bithynia in 112 AD. Here's what he said. The Christians were, quote, in the habit of meeting on a certain fixed day before it was light. When they sang an anthem to Christ as God and bound themselves by a solemn oath not to commit any wicked deed, after which it was their custom to separate, then to meet again to partake of food, food of a, of an, but a food of an ordinary and innocent kind. He's talking about the Lord's Supper, taking the communion. Now this is an outside, this is an outside perspective outside of the church. He's reporting back to Caesar, and the governors had to report back to whoever was on the throne seat in Rome and kind of give the happenings of it. Well, Christianity was really growing by that time. By this time in the empire, 25% estimated or 65 million people of the world's population in the Roman Empire had already converted. And so he's acting as a reporter for Caesar. And it's such an interesting thing that his, obser his observations and the reports he got, this is what they were doing. Okay, so we learned quite a bit of detail from an outside perspective. But it's so interesting that they say they would meet again to partake of food, but a food of an ordinary and innocent kind. He goes on, he's talking about our communion that we have. And so we must be careful to preserve the meaning of the Lord's Supper or risk making it ritualistic. It's not a ritual that we're doing. It's not something, because when you see, use the word ritual, you have all kinds of rituals. You know how you brush your teeth is a ritual. You know, you brush your teeth the same way pretty much. People, they found, they go, shoo, 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 whatever pattern you have, that's what you're going to do. That's your ritual. Maybe you get up and eat oatmeal every morning. That's your ritual. But when you partake of the Lord's Supper, it should be new to us every single time. And so as the people of the Bible, we should not be afraid of tough questions concerning our pattern within corporate worship on the first day of the week. It's through the tough questions that you can eliminate doctrinal error. And so question number one, uh, question uh, number one is four important questions we're going to answer today, is when and by whom was our communion instituted? Is it something that man instituted, or is it something that uh, God wanted? Well, according to Matthew 26, 26 through 30, it says, And while they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after blessing, a blessing, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken the cup, and giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now until the day. This is important. We're going to be examining just that line next week. It's very, very crucial. Uh, until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And so Jesus, in this passage and his parallel accounts in Mark 14 and Luke 22, we find the occasion of the Passover feast of the Jews. And uh, this was to celebrate their deliverance from Egypt. <clears throat> now Jesus informed the disciples that after partaking of the fruit of the vine and the unleavened bread, that there was something new coming in contrast to the old covenant. And Jesus awaited his new kingdom, verse 29, that we see there. There's a new kingdom that's going to be coming. And he informed the disciples after partaking of this that uh, he would soon be crucified, buried, and resurrected to begin the ushering out of the old covenant. All those things are going to happen. Now, according to Ephesians, 
uh, Jesus inaugurated the new to begin the putting away of the old. Okay? Ephesians 2, 14 and 15. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of the commandments contained in the ordinances, that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. And so... Hebrews 9.16 says, For where the covenant is, there must be the necess necessity of the death of the one who made it. So that's how it would enact from the old to the new covenant. Something has to die. And that something would be someone. His name is Jesus. For the covenant, it says, is only valid when men are dead. For it, was, it is never enforced while the one who made it lives. So we know what would usher in the new kingdom and what the Lord's Supper would be accompanied with. So question, so who was it who instituted and when was it? Right here is when Jesus instituted what we do on Sunday morning. Okay, this was something new for them. So question number two is, what is the significance of communion for those who partake of it? See, we're going to take the Lord's Supper here very, very shortly. What's the, what is the significance of what we're doing? Because if we don't know what the significance is, then it's just a ritual. Okay? 1 Corinthians 10, 16 says this. Is this not the cup of blessing which we Bless a sharing of the blood of Christ. Is it not the bread which we break a sharing of the body of Christ? And so the purpose of the Lord's Supper being in worship is to nurture a, quote, sharing in the blood and the body of Christ. Because that's what we all have in common. We're sharing in the blood and the body of Christ. Because we are the body of Christ. And it's the blood that put us into the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians, Paul elaborates further. He says in 1 Corinthians 11, 25 to 28, he gives us four ways to center our mind during the Lord's Supper. He says in the same way he took the cup, he's talking about Jesus, and after uh, the supper saying, this is the cup of the new covenant of my blood, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Say remembrance. Remember, so remember that now. Uh, for as often as you eat of the bread and drink of the cup, you proclaim, say the word proclaim, proclaim. okay? The Lord's death until he comes. Say until he comes. Until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. That's what we're at risk of. And then he says, but a man must examine, say the word examine himself and in so doing let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup we got four thoughts that could go through our mind because sometimes we get distracted I mean let's face it we get distracted and it's so important I mean the Lord's Supper is so key to our worship together that we don't want to be distracted so the best way to not be distracted is to be focused and so there's four focuses. Remembrance, proclaim until he comes, and examine. Let's look at that. The four ways we share in the blood and the body of Christ. First, commemoration. Remembrance. Do this in remembrance of me. What are we trying to remember? Well, first of all, we remember that Jesus Christ was dead, buried, resurrected, and that tomb was empty. We can check that. Do you know we can check that? Is the tomb still empty? Yeah, yep, that tomb is just as empty today as it was the third day when Jesus rose from the dead. We have to remember that. You see, uh, we go to cemeteries and maybe decorate graves to remember somebody, to hold them in memory. I like going to cemeteries. So, you know, I've taken a lot of people to cemeteries. I just walk through and I just think, you know, who is this person? This marker represents somebody. But what cemetery do we go to to remember Jesus? Because his tomb was empty. 
He is not here. He is risen. And so the point is, when we take the Lord's Supper, when we break that bread and we drink that cup, our soul is transported to not a cemetery, but to an empty tomb that we remember Jesus overcame death. He holds the keys of death in Hades, Revelation 1, verse 18. He has overcome death. So we remember that. So we think about that. So, next one, proclamation. The word for proclamation is to proclaim, to teach and preach a message. Evangelismos. And so, what is it that we're proclaiming? You proclaim his death. You know, the best sermon we have on any Sunday, any first day of the week, isn't what I do. When we li- if we're looking over at our brother and sister and they're breaking that bread, you don't hear the words, but you better be thinking of it, that this brother and this sister believes Jesus died on that cross for me. His body was broken up on me. When the bread breaks up in our mouths and it goes down, and just as much as that broken bread is in your, uh, your digestive tract, Jesus' broken body should be in our soul at that point. And so we look, and if I see Sister Phyllis, you know, we do not allow a woman to teach her to usurp authority over a man. But you know what? The silent sermon we hear when we see each other break that bread, we're both, we're all proclaiming, I believe Jesus broke his body on the cross for me. And when we drink that cup, when, 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 when uh, 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 Stan drinks that cup, I should be able to look over, and, 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 and what am I hearing? The best sermon of all? that Jesus' blood cleanses him and me from We're in that covenant together. And so it's a proclamation. But then here's another focus, anticipation, until he comes. You know, Jesus is not slack concerning his promise. He's coming back, and he's going to clean house, and he's going to take those to heaven. He's, he is absolutely going to come. He's coming back. You know, if, we, we, if we're looking up like that, we know the skies will be rolled back as a scroll and Jesus Christ in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ until he comes. It's with anticipation. So we have commemoration, proclamation, anticipation, and the fourth one, examination. Let a man examine himself and in so doing let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Now, that's a really neat word examination. You know, I've seen over the years, and we better drive this thought out of our head, because it's not scriptural. It's anti-scriptural. When somebody says, well, I'm not going to take the Lord's Supper today because I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. I'm telling you, I've seen it before. You might have done it. But in the examination process, you're not examining yourself to say, I am worthy. You examine yourself and you say, I need him. I need forgiveness. It's a recognition that we're broken and Jesus is the fixer. And so we have examination. We look at ourselves and we say, man, I'm telling you, I struggle in this way. I struggle in that way. And thank you, God, for having mercy on me and forgiving me all along the way, and I will continue to walk in the light as he is in the light. That's the examination point at that. And so, four reasons we take the Lord's Supper, and these are four focuses. So let's say, for example, if you're looking down and you're taking the Lord's Supper, remember Jesus was in a tomb. He was buried. And then if you're looking, if, if you're looking over at your brother or sister, maybe that's where your eyes are. You focus on that they believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross, broke his body, and his blood cleanses us. Hallelujah. And then anticipation. And let's say you're looking up. Mm-hmm, I'll take the Lord's Supper. Those skies will be rolled back as a scroll. He's coming back. Anticipation. And then examination. Maybe you're just looking down at you. That's okay. Because all four are ways that we focus and get our mind ready to take the Lord's Supper. If we focus with commemoration, proclamation, anticipation, examination, there is no way you can drink that in an unworthy manner because it's exactly what God said we must do. And so, 
when the question comes up, what's the significance? What's the significance of the communion supper for those who partake of it? There you have it right there. Paul clearly told us that. And so, with that in mind, question number three. What is the frequency that we partake of the communion? You know, there are some denominational churches out there, they take it during Christmas and Easter. Some take it once a month, like, like a lot of Baptist churches say, once a month, once a month, that's when we'll take it. Some people just take it once a year. Some people take it every week. Some people even take it away from Sunday. They do. They just go ahead. To, we can do it Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Well, what's the frequency? Does the Bible talk about that? Absolutely. It's based in the Jewish Passover because that's what it was inaugurated in. And so with that in mind, Exodus 12, 14, now this day will be a memorial to you and you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. That was the conditions of the Passover. Numbers 9, 9 through 11 says the second month of the 14th day twilight, you shall observe it. So what does that have to do with us? Well, how often does the assembly of the Lord partake in the Lord's Supper? Is it yearly, like the Passover, four times a year, whenever we feel like it? What does the Bible say? Well, let's see if we can't figure this out, okay? Doesn't take Solomonic splendored wisdom to figure this out. Let's go ahead, we'll read these verses. Here's some clues, some clues from the same book. If you were already in 1 Corinthians, you just flip a page. 1 Corinthians 11, 17, because you come together. 11, verse 18, when you come together as a church. 11, 20, therefore, when you meet together. 1 Corinthians 11, 33, so then, my brethren, when you come together. 11, 34, come together. 1423, therefore, when the whole church should assemble together. 1426, what is the outcome? When you assemble. 1 Corinthians 16, 2 identifies this day as the first day of every week. There you have it. Sunday, Sunday when we assemble as a church. They were in the habit of meeting together on the first day of the week, partaking of the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 17 uh, well, I guess, I, yeah, 1 Corinthians 4, 17 says this. For this reason, Paul said, I teach the same thing in every church. Now, if you think about that for a second, I teach the same thing in every church. Well, that means if he's teaching the Corinthians that we may meet on the first day of the week, and by the way, there you have it again in Acts 20, verse 7, 1 Corinthians 11.33 uh, as well confirms that, that if Paul's teaching the Corinthians that, and then he says to the Corinthians, I teach the same thing in every church, including Junction City Church of Christ. And so Acts 20, verse 7, on the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, is what it said. So we have that example there. So when do we partake of it? The first day of the week, every week, because God expects us to be meeting together on the first day of the week, and when we assemble together, we partake of the Lord's Supper. Now, question number four. What should we use for the items of communion? Doesn't make any difference if you use Kool-Aid and potato chips. I actually heard, uh, not a Church of Christ preacher, but I heard a denominational guy one time saying, it doesn't matter what you use, you can use potato chips and Kool-Aid. That's exactly what he said. In fact, they used Pepsi-Cola and saltine crackers one time. Huh. That's weird. Well, but is it scriptural or not? The Bible's not solid on this either. First Corinthians, or... Uh, it was unleavened bread and fruit of the vine. That's what they had. Based on Deuteronomy 16, 1 through 8, the Jews used unleavened bread for Passover. They didn't have the choice of potato chips, pizza, or Pop-Tarts. Okay? They used unleavened bread. One might say, well, that's true, but the law is not part of the new covenant. I'm glad you brought that up. 
Yes, but when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, he did it under the old covenant and transitionary. He used unleavened bread because that was the bread of the Passover. And so to do otherwise opens up a door for dangerous behavior. If you have a precedent, then for you to deviate from that pre precedent, you have to show that you have the freedom to do that. Otherwise, you stick with the precedent. Uh, concerning the fruit of the vine, Jesus made reference to the contents of the cup, not the cup itself. It says he took the fruit of the vine. See, a lot of times you get some, some brethren who focus, we should do one cup. We should do uh, little cups. We should do, the, the focus was never the cup, okay? The focus was what was in the cup, which was symbolic of the blood of Christ. Now, one might be compelled to feel that this is nitpicking, but is it really? When Noah was commanded to build the ark in Genesis 6, uh, verse 14, he was to build it in gopher wood. Remember? Well, what's gopher wood? That's when he told Ham, Shem, and Japheth, go for some wood. Gopher wood. <laughs> I, no, gopher wood was a pressed laminated type board. It was like an ancient plywood board type. And he was supposed to make that. Now, he was given the promise, you go make it the way I told you, that boat's going to float. But what if he wanted to use cherry wood or walnut? Do you think that ship would have floated if it was contingent upon the pro process? We don't know for sure, but we do know that if we call something biblical and yet we're running from the Bible and trying to explain it, and this is a, usually a clue. If you hear somebody issue a sentence that says, well, the Bible doesn't say, and then they go on to espouse what they want, Lord's Supper was inaugurated by Jesus at the Passover. Yes or no? Amen. Okay. The Lord's Supper is an expression of our sharing of Christ in commemoration, proclamation, anticipation, examination. Yes or no? Yes. Okay. The Lord's Supper was to be taken on the first day of the week. Yes or no? Yes. Okay. The Lord's Supper was to be taken in the manner of the inauguration, unleavened bread, fruit of the vine. Yes or no? With that in mind, when we go take the Lord's Supper, following this uh, invitation song, really focus our minds in a way. I mean, just block everything else out and go to the empty tomb of Jesus and let your heart be nurtured. Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt stands a monument of great pride. You know, this, the, this is as tall as the St. Louis arc, Arch is. It would not even pass under. It would scrape it. It's pretty big. It has 2.3 million blocks of stone, each weighing 2 to 15 tons. Some 100,000 men spent 20 years to build that very thing. But the sands have worn away the surface, and thieves have stolen its treasures. Unlike the, uh, that memorial, one instituted by the Lord the night of his betrayal, doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't speak of pride, this, this was just a burial place. This was a grave marker. This big thing was a grave marker to Pharaoh uh, uh, Khufu. 13 acres that took up. That's the biggest grave marker you've ever seen, isn't it? But see, like Jesus, he initiated the Lord's Supper on that night. His memorial doesn't speak of pride, but of love and sacrifice. Jesus wants his marker to be right here on our heart. Its beauty cannot be diminished by time and its treasure stolen by thieves. Each time we share the bread and the cup together, the power of Jesus' memorial is right there in our heart. And we need to be focused in such a way